Many thanks, uh, Mr. Secretary, and happily we have a good amount of time for uh, questions. I've got uh, eight or nine people on the list already. Uh, tap your name badge, press the green touchscreen, press the silver button, you'll be on my list. Uh, the per first person to catch my uh, eye is Josh Rogan from the U.S. Josh. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time today and for your service. Um, as the Trump administration tries to strengthen our alliances and partnerships to implement what your own national defense strategy calls our strategic competition with China, the way in which the Trump administration is picking fights with allies and partners, for example on trade, but certainly not exclusively on trade, seems profoundly counterproductive. If one of China's strategic aims is to separate the United States from its allies and partners, aren't we doing their work for them? Thank you. Well, first of all, I would just tell you that uh, when I travel the region, uh, we find a great deal of common purpose uh, with our partners, with our allies, even with non-traditional uh, partners and allies, uh, new uh, relationships that are uh, coming uh, afresh to us that were not ones that we enjoyed as short as five years ago or 10 years ago. So in my, the reality of what I find as I travel, the short answer is no, we are not. <clears throat> now there are areas where friends disagree. There are areas where we compete in trade. But there is an underlying uh, basis, a fundamental respect for certain values. And I would just say those values were extremely well articulated last evening by the Prime Minister of India when he spoke about respect for international law that sort of thing. There was a, a president that we had a few years ago that I referenced earlier, uh, President Thomas Jefferson, and uh, he made a statement that in something so complicated as the science of what he called political economy, no one axiom can be laid down as wise and expedient for all times and circumstances. Certainly, uh, we have had some unusual approaches, I'll be candid with you, some unusual approaches to how we deal with these issues. But I'm reminded that so long as nations continue dialogues, so long as they continue to listen to one another and to pay respect for one another, nothing's over uh, based on one decision one day. And the enduring sharing of values, the enduring respect always provides a forum for us to move a relationship forward in a positive manner. And again, I would repeat, in a positive manner, a positive direction. Uh, from Indonesia, Dr. Sylvia Yazid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. When we are talking about strategic partnership in this region, uh, of course, we, are also, we also have to deal with gaps of capabilities. May we know wh what U.S. have um, the strategies for to deal with these gaps in capabilities among nations in this region. Thank you. You know, as, as we look at this, uh, this issue, uh, it's one that we confronted inside the strategy because too often we've seen the very gap you refer to actually set us apart from, from allies, from partners, from those who are dealing with uh, terrorism, for example, or uh, other uh, transnational threats. And what you have to do <clears throat> when you're in our position, you have to adjust everything from your training to the liaison opportunities to the education opportunities and use education and training as the primary avenues to close those gaps. I think that what we will see in the future is I direct a by, with, and through military strategy for the U.S. military and Indo-Pacific Command. You're going to see us more capable of closing that gap from our end, where before we stood back, said this is the way we do business. Now we are going to come to you and say, how do you do business? And here's what we've learned, whether it be in combating terrorism, or in maritime operations and share those lessons in a manner that can be embraced and then we assist you also with high-end capabilities if that's what the gap uh, is based on 
and bring you forward as your sovereign decisions say this is a priority for you. So we believe the gap can be closed and it really comes down to whether or not we have the political will and the military wisdom to close the gap. It, if we know the gap can be closed, we all recognize that. It's just whether or not we choose to do so. I'm quite confident we can close the gap as we go forward. We do not find any military out here that is somehow uh, in a position where they cannot grow and we cannot grow alongside them in terms of partnership. We can overcome the gaps. And from India, Sheila Bhatt. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, the America has changed name of Pacific Command recently to U.S. Pacific Command. Sir, I wanted to know what does it signify? What is the symbolism in it? <laughs> right. Uh, with the symbolism, <clears throat> uh, I've been asked about that several times uh, last night and this morning. Uh, the bottom line is we should be willing to adapt the name of the command to reflect more accurately its focus. And as we look right now at the role of the Indian Ocean with the largest democracy in the world coming into its own with economic progress there in India, we need to recognize that there's a growing significance to the Indian Ocean, to the Indian subcontinent, and certainly to India itself. So I want to make certain that the title actually reflects the reality. Uh, and there's a changing reality. The world's always changing, and that's all this was. Now, underneath that, there are things that have been going on which show, as I referenced in my prepared remarks, that we are, in fact, dealing with our priority theater. I, I don't trumpet those things. Uh, we've replaced, for example, third-generation fighters with fifth-generation fighters. We've added our most capable ships to the uh, commander of Indo-Pacific Command's uh, fleet uh, during the last uh, year or two, and we will continue to address this theater as a priority and properly defined as now the Indo-Pacific Command. And from uh, China, Senior Colonel Zhao, Zhao Zhu. Uh, thank you. Uh, a couple of years ago, the United States sent the, the Antietam missile cruiser and uh, the Hawkins missile destroyer to China's territorial waters. And uh, I think it is a violation of the law of the People's Republic of China on territorial waters and, and the contiguous zone. And also, it is uh, obvious provocation to China's national security and uh, territorial in integrity. I think uh, it is the militarization in the South China Sea under the name of the freedom of navigation. So I'd like to have your comment on this. Yeah, uh, Colonel, I think it goes to a fundamental uh, disconnect between the way the international tribunals uh, have looked at these waters. Uh, these waters to us are free and open international waters. Uh, we all talk about a free and open uh, Pacific, a free and open Asia Pacific, a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, freedom means freedom for all nations, large and small, to transit international airspace, international waters. Traditionally, historically, uh, and by the rule of law, this is, not a, uh, this is not a revisionist view. This is a traditional view. This is an established view, and we've had international tribunals uh, reinforce this. Independent from us, they, we, don't, we don't control it. Uh, it was under UNCLOS. Uh, and so when we see uh, those kind of uh, manifestations of interpretations of international law, then we act accordingly. We do not do freedom of navigation for America alone. We do freedom of navigation. It's freedom for all nations, large and small, that need to transit those waters for their own prosperity. And they have every reason to do so. So we do not see it as a militarization by going through what has traditionally been an international water space. 
uh, what we see it as is a reaffirmation of the rules-based order. And we, I, again, I will be going to Beijing to have further discussions on this at your government's uh, invitation here at the end of the month. But I understand the, dis the disagreement, uh, but it is not one on which we are unstudied and we believe it's only appropriate that we keep those waterways open for all nations. And from Thailand, Dr. Termsak Chalem Palunapap. Uh, I'm, you may have turned off your microphone, I fear, so f <clears throat> go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my I'm, I'm afraid you've turned off your microphone, so perhaps I'll just go to someone else and come back to you when uh, someone comes to sort that out. Mark Champion from the UK. Uh, Secretary, um, thank you. Um, I think it's clear that you have established this year, last year, and for some time, uh, agreement on those principles of uh, the uh, rules-based order, freedom of navigation, uh, you know, among uh, most of the allies who, who come here. Um, I, but the, uh, there's an increasing question, I think, about whether, um, not to mix metaphors, but the, the ship has sailed. In other words, uh, the military assets that you were protesting against and their placement uh, on islands that have already been built, they're there, they're not going to move, and the role that China, whatever role it is that China seeks to use them for, um, is going to continue. Um, do you think that, uh, that in, in essence, uh, it's correct that that ship has sailed and you're going to have to deal with it? Well, I, I think that dealing with it is a reality. I think there are consequences uh, to China ignoring uh, the international community. Uh, we firmly believe in the non-coercive aspects of how nations should uh, get along with each other, that they should listen to each other. Nothing wrong with competition, nothing wrong with having strong positions, but when it comes down to introducing uh, what they have done in the South China Sea, there are consequences. Uh, I would tell you that up until, if you'd asked me two months ago, uh, I'd have said we are still attempting to maintain a cooperative stance with the PRC, with China. Uh, we are inviting them to the RIMPAC, the world's largest naval exercise, in order to try to keep the open lines of military communication between us uh, and transparency. But uh, when you look at what President Xi said in the Rose Garden of the White House in 2015, that they would not militarize the Spratleys, and then we watched what happened four weeks ago, uh, it was time to say there's a consequence to this, and the world's largest naval exercise will not have the Chinese Navy uh, participating. But that's a relatively small consequence. I believe there are much larger consequences in the future when nations lose the rapport of their neighbors, when they believe that uh, piling mountainous debts on their neighbors and somehow removing the freedom of political action uh, is the way to engage with them. Eventually, these things do not pay off, even if on the financial ledger sheet or the uh, power ledger sheet they appear to. It's a very shaky foundation when we believe that militarizing features are somehow going to endorse their standing in the world uh, and, and enhance it. It is not, it's not going to be endorsed in the world. It's not going to enhance it. And you have to wonder why uh, military actions that are politically injurious would be engaged in by a nation. Uh, what is the value to having uh, carried out military operations. Number one, we all know nobody is ready to invade those features. They Certainly we could have had the dispute resolution go on in a peaceful way. To simply muscle the way in using weapons to do what international tribunals do not endorse is not a way to make long-term collaboration the rule of the road in a region that's as important to China's future, and we respect that as it is to every other nation's future out here. So there are consequences that will continue to uh, come home to roost, so to speak, 
with uh, China if they do not find a way to work more collaboratively with all of the nations who have interests. Dr. Tamsak. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, Mr. Secretary, what else can ASEAN do as far as the FOIP is concerned? So far, ASEAN as a group is only asking for more details. So in your opinion, what else can ASEAN as a group do? Uh, number one, we see ASEAN centrality in, a, in effect being a way to have a forum where the nations can come together and certainly some nations are small, they don't have big militaries, they have smaller economies, but they all have a voice, they all have human beings who deserve a future and need prospects of, of advantage. This is the normal thing that nations do for their people. It's why, frankly, we're all here at Shangri-La. I mean, we wouldn't be here if we didn't recognize our interactions with each other. I think when you look at ASEAN, uh, it has always been a very non-contentious organization. It looks for ways to deal with things maturely. How do you make things win-win rather than win-lose? How can everybody benefit? Now, when they speak with one voice, there is a much stronger uh, lesson coming out of ASEAN, a lesson that we can all learn from. I think, too, that we have to uh, avoid, uh, I would just uh, point out the what Prime Minister Modi uh, called last night the impossible burdens of debt. Mm -hmm. Certain nations can actually lose their freedom uh, simply by taking what appears to be a hand up when in fact it's a hand out that makes them dependent. So if the ASEAN nations can help one another and support one another in a way that maintains the freedom, the sovereignty, the territorial integrity of each of the nations, then that, in effect, strengthens ASEAN's voice. But I think it's most important that ASEAN look for unity on these fundamental values that Prime Minister Modi went into quite good detail about last night. And the idea that we're going to turn over this world to our children without having the same kinds of values, the same advantages that we have enjoyed as these nations came out from underneath the yoke of colonialism uh, I think that's, that's a very irresponsible position. We're going to have to pull together and deal with it in a unified way. ASEAN centrality means it is fundamental to that effort. And from France, François Bourg. Uh, thank you. Last year at the uh, previous uh, Shangri-La dialogue, in response to a question from the floor, uh, sir, you <coughs> urged America's allies, I quote, to bear with us, end of quote. Does this recommendation still stand? And on a more personal note, how are you bearing up? I hate it when someone quotes me from the year before. <laughs> <laughs> Never happens. Uh, well, sir, uh, I would just tell you that uh, based on my travels over the last year, I've, I've been out in the region six times since I was last here, some for extended trips. Uh, and I, I enjoy doing a lot of listening when I'm out and about. Uh, we continue to find more common ground than uncommon ground. We continue to find more reasons for collaboration than not. And remember, this is an America that if you go back several hundred years to President Jefferson, uh, from then on, we saw this as an opportunity out in the Pacific to stand with nations. Our first Treaty of Amity was with Thailand back in the early 1800s. For 200 years, we've been here. For 200 years, we've watched the European colonial wave come through and then recede. We have watched uh, fascism, imperialism, wash over the region, and at a great cost to many of us in this room and our forefathers, it was pushed back and defeated by 1945. We watched Soviet communism as it tried to push into the region, and the Cold War blunted, stopped, and rolled that back. So we have been here. We have seen those who want to dominate the region come and watch them go, and we've stood with you. So this is not about one decision at this point in time. 
This is not about areas that we may find uncommon right now and we may be dealing with in unusual ways, but the bottom line is that we have been through thick and thin. We have stood with nations and they all recognize today we believe in the free and independent and sovereign nations out here. And I would just tell you that we are not going to change our mind on this. After that rather nasty argument we had with King George III, my apologies to our UK <laughs> comrades, uh, we, we have stood on this same principle and it's not based on which party's in power, it is not based on, on a fleeting uh, position. This is one we look back on with a great deal of uh, confidence. So I also look forward to the future with confidence and uh, I'm, I'm doing just fine, thank you, no problem. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Uh, I <laughs> And from Japan, Hiroyuki Akita. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Hiro Akita from Nikkei, Japan. I have two quick questions about the North Korean crisis. One is that uh, in late April, as I remember, you implied that the uh, status of US troops in Korean Peninsula will be on the negotiation table if uh, peace talk between South and North will make a progress. And does it mean that uh, uh, it is also option for U.S. to withdraw or reduce uh, U.S. military footprint in Korean Peninsula in case of the, you know, if uh, there was a progress between South and uh, North uh, peace talks? And second question is that uh, President Trump announced that there is there's going to be a meeting in, on June 12th uh, between Mr. Trump and Kim, Mr. Kim Jong-un. And he said that he doesn't want to talk about uh, maximum pressure anymore. And so uh, my question is that, is military option still on the table? Or while you talk, US talk with North Korea, maybe it is off the table. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, obviously, the eyes of the world, the hopes of the world are, are on these talks. Uh, and I would just say to our Singapore hosts, uh, here today, they are also hosting these talks and we are grateful uh, that you have been able to on such short notice with the usual uh, to and fro of something as historically uh, groundbreaking as this, the way you've just taken it all in stride, uh, we, we, uh, we are grateful for that sort of support. Uh, I would tell you that any discussion about the number of U.S. troops in the Republic of Korea is subject to one, uh, the Republic of Korea's invitation to have them there and the discussions between the United States and the Republic of Korea, separate and distinct from the negotiations that are going on with DPRK. Mm -hmm. they have, they, those, that issue will not come up in the discussions with DPRK. And as you all recognize, those troops are there as a recognition of a security challenge, obviously, if the diplomats can do their work, if we can reduce uh, the threat, uh, if we can restore confidence building measures with, with something verifiable, then of course these kinds of issues can come up subsequently between two sovereign democracies, the Republic of Korea and the United States. But it is, that issue is not on the table here in Singapore on the 12th, uh, nor should it be. Uh, as far as uh, military options, uh, I think you're aware, uh, and I said this last year when I was here, I have said it in every public forum when I've been asked about this issue. This has been a diplomatically led issue since January 22nd of last year when we came into office. It has been diplomatically led, it has been diplomatically reinforced at the UN Security Council with three, just since January of last year, three unanimous Security Council resolutions. It was diplomatically led when Canada hosted the sending nation's foreign ministers. These are the nations that sent troops to the Korean Peninsula in response to the United Nations call in 1950. Canada hosted the foreign ministers, not the defense ministers, uh, in, at Vancouver, British Columbia, in a discussion this last January to further the diplomatic efforts uh, to try to bring this issue to close. 
Uh, so we still stand for the verifiable and irreversible uh, denuclearization of, of the peninsula. And the diplomats are engaged right now in New York. Uh, the advanced teams are engaged here in Singapore. And I think the hopes of all of us lie with them. And from uh, Australia, Gordon Flake. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Over the last several months, there's been a lot of discussion about the quadrilateral dialogue between the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. Um, and so much so that it's been a bit of a straw man uh, thrown up there as evidence of the, the lack of robustness of the Indo-Pacific. And yet in your remarks and in the Prime Minister's remarks last night, the Quad didn't come up in specific. I'm curious as to your assessment of the relationship between the Quad itself and the Indo-Pacific strategy as you've outlined it. Uh, very good. The, uh, the Quad, as you, as you characterize it accurately, is certainly one of those additional mechanisms, multilateral mechanisms that we look to. Uh, we look to it to be, and, and look at what is the common character there. Australia, Japan, and India, and the United States. All four are democracies. That's the first thing that, that jumps out at you. So we have four democracies that are talking about how do we maintain stability, how do we maintain open navigation, how do we talk about basically keeping things on a peaceful dispute resolution path. And I think that uh, it w it's absolutely an idea fit for its time, and I support it 100%. I, uh, I actually had my seven-hour speech here, and that was one of the things I cut out in order to reduce <laughs> it somewhat. Um, and uh, from the United States, uh, Senator Dan Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for an outstanding speech and your exceptional leadership. We in the U.S. Senate also think you're doing fine, so I'm glad you think you're doing fine. Um, you know, as the Secretary of Defense, you've also spoken very articulately about the importance of economic issues and uh, financial issues. And in addition to your leadership, where we're, we are very focused on rebuilding our military, uh, we are also back home in the United States reinvigorating uh, very strongly our economy, hoping to be growing at 3 to 4 percent GDP growth, which we haven't seen in well over a decade, and areas like energy, where we are now once again the world's energy superpower in terms of the production of oil, production of natural gas, production of renewables. Can you um, talk to those issues and how you see them fitting in the broader Indo-Pacific strategy for the United States and how important those are as well as military matters? I can, uh, Senator, one of our senators from a Pacific uh, Ocean state of the state of Alaska. Uh, the ec economic, uh, the economy of our country has always been the economic engine that drove our national security. So restoring the economic underpinnings has been essential as the administration came into, uh, came into office with its responsibilities. But we see this uh, almost as the way we uh, hear it explained to us every time we get on an airliner. You, and you've all heard the speech that in the event of loss of cabin pressure, your mask will drop, put your own mask on first, and then help others around you. We see what we're doing here as a way to economically build our own enduring strength, but we do not see that, nor have we ever seen that, as something selfish. You know what we did with the Marshall Plan after World War II. Uh, Senator Gardner also joins us here. Uh, he has got an initiative uh, with heavy bipartisan support in the U.S. Senate, the House of Representatives, for the Asia reassurance, uh, basically, how are we going to reinforce our friends, partners, allies in the Pacific? How do we share that kind of economic vitality that we are going to have in terms of technology, in terms of military, uh, the military connection, and most importantly, how do we help the development of those nations that are still lagging behind or still coming out of difficult circumstance? So this is basically our, our, our engine again today that it has been ever since around 1900 uh, that kept us as an arsenal of freedom, an arsenal of democracy. But it's also meant in the broader terms 
of democratic values being reinforced by using the economic sinews that we are now developing once again in a much more robust manner, if that addresses your question, Senator. And from Pakistan, Ali Sawar Nakfi. Mr. Secretary, it's a pleasure to hear you speak about U.S. strategy in the Pacific region. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I had a think tank in Islamabad, Pakistan. Uh, there are perceptions that uh, different people have about different things. We feel that the United States is, of course, interested in peace and stability of the South Asian region, uh, but is not paying enough attention to the nuclear situation in our region. Uh, the nuclear weapons capability of India and Pakistan on land was worrying in uh, many ways already, and now India has embarked upon the nuclearization of the Indian Ocean with the Arihant and the Brahmos and all other uh, uh, naval uh, vessels, uh, submarines, uh, nuclear powered and nuclear armed submarines, uh, which is not only uh, a cause of a strategic instability in the, uh, in, uh, between India and Pakistan, it's also a security uh, worry for 32 literal states uh, that are all located in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, um, would you like to comment, sir, on this? And I have another small question, if I can quickly do it, Mr. Chapman. If you can quickly do it. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, Indian role in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, uh, India is not a, a, a neighbor or contiguous to Afghanistan. So uh, uh, I don't know how U.S. visualizes an Indian role in Afghanistan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very good questions. On we, we put together several strategies, and one common theme in our Indo-Pacific strategy, and certainly in what we called our South Asia strategy, which was the one that uh, within which we contribute to, to the NATO-led campaign in Afghanistan, uh, a theme, it, these are not exclusive strategies. These are, are, are not confrontational strategies. They are based on the idea of cooperation, for example, we regionalized our strategy in South Asia, so we were not looking at Afghanistan in isolation. Uh, and obviously, when you look at South Asia, then Pakistan and India were two of the nations we had to consider. Their legitimate security interests, their potential role in restoring peace in a, an area where a war has gone on too long already. And so we put these strategies together as a way to find common ground regionally, not as a way to find an exclusive club. So in terms of non, now narrow that down to non-proliferation, I believe that we have got to give, as, an, as a world community, as a global community, more attention to non-proliferation. Clearly, we do not need any more of these kinds of crises where we have looked away from the problem in DPRK for too long, and now we are confronting something where the hopes of the world is almost, almost everyone's catching their breath as we wish well to the diplomats upon whom this burden has now dropped. Uh, there are ways to maintain a world with a non-proliferation as an ongoing issue, an ongoing effort by all of us nuclear armed and not nuclear armed. In the, in the case of the US, after we came out with our national defense strategy, we came out with a nuclear uh, posture review, an NPR, something that, by the way, before I rolled it out, we went to a number of allies, more than two dozen allies, and briefed them ahead of time and took their ideas on board. Uh, because these are the, the, this nuclear deterrent is probably the most, uh, the heaviest issue that I deal with every day in this job. So what we want to do is as we modernize to keep the nuclear deterrent safe and effective so those weapons are never used, 
we have to have a significant effort, collaborative effort with it of non-proliferation as we try to reduce the, this scourge. And that's the only way you can describe nuclear weapons in this world. So we will work on this. And I think in the Indian Ocean, uh, I think you bring up a good point. It's one of the areas we as a world need to give more attention to. How do we reduce the concerns of, uh, of the countries there so they don't have to resort to a, a larger uh, nuclear stockpile? Uh, and very quickly on uh, India's role in Afghanistan, uh, India is a South Asian nation. It is impacted by the aura of terrorism wherever it is, especially closer to home. And we know that India has been grievously attacked by terrorists in the past. They have a distinct vital national interest in reducing the terrorism threat. As such, their impact in Afghanistan goes to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars of development money. And there are highways, there are schools, medical clinics. Uh, you'll notice there are no Indian troops on the ground as they understand there is a, a role for development here as they try to stay stabilizing without aggravating the concerns of the Pakistan government, of your country's government. So it's a difficult issue, but I think it's also one that India is operating in the best interests of the region and of the world as they try to help through development funds to remove the root causes of why young men pick up guns or, or listen uh, to the lies of the terrorists and then they get off once they start thinking in this direction. It is very difficult to, uh, to bring them back to a civilized behavior. And so I, I like what India is doing there. I support it. I think we need more education and less fighting in the world. And I see India foremost in this effort in Afghanistan. I've got about 14 people on the list. I'm just going to take two. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Ordaniel from the Philippines. Uh, you have mentioned the South China Sea quite extensively in your speech, uh, Mr. Secretary. So my question is related to the U.S.-Philippine alliance. Because in 2014, President Obama, when he was visiting Manila, was asked twice by a journalist if uh, Philippine-occupied features and Filipino public vessels in the South China Sea are covered by the 1951 U.S.-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty. And twice he sidelined the question. Um, when Secretary Hillary Clinton was asked the same question, she said that she does not want to discuss hypothetical scenarios. But let me just ask the same question to you, Mr. Secretary, because I think the answer to this question is very important as to how the Duterte administration is going to move ahead with its own maritime security policy. So in essence, the question is, are Filipino public vessels and Philippine-occupied features in the South China Sea covered by the 1951 U.S.-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's good to see someone without my color hair here, young man. I appreciate that. Um, the, le let me tell you that when we have discussions on these matters, the reason why public figures do not want to give specific answers is that these are complex issues. And when you start saying yes, no, black, white, uh, we, have, we have been on the record about international tribunals that say there is no such thing as a nine-dash line, there is no le legal uh, basis for this. Uh, we stand by international law, we stand by international tribunals, we listen to each nation's concerns. And to simply turn it into a, a military or non-military response is, is a uh, shortchanging of the issue. Uh, this is what diplomacy is all about. Diplomacy is all about taking contrary perspectives and finding common ground. Uh, and we've got to try to do that in this world. Uh, those of us who have worn uniforms, those who wear uniforms today are keenly aware of the cost of war. And there has got to be a commitment, not a, uh, well, when it suits me, I'll listen to other nations. Not when it suits me, I'll listen to international tribunals. It's got to be that we actually want to live by these rules, these rules that have allowed China to recover many people from the depths of poverty and bring up their quality of life. These rules have helped China. There is a reason why China, I believe, 
will eventually come to grips with the needs and the expectations of the neighbors around it. Uh, and further, I would just tell you that we maintain confidentiality at times in these efforts. And I, I mean, it's a free and open uh, press here, and I, I support that. But at the same time, you can often do most of your good work in setting the conditions for a path ahead by not locking yourself into public statements where, uh, understandably, people take each word separately apart and now pretty soon you're, you're locked into positions that do not allow the diplomats to find common ground. So I'm not trying to give a, a civics class here. I just want you to understand why in many cases those who actually carry the responsibility uh, do not go for it's my way or the highway or there's only one position. That would, might very well be a going in position and we stand by our treaty allies. Uh, but this is a discussion between the current administration in the Manila and in Washington, D.C. And it's not one that can be answered uh, as simply as uh, I, your question would indicate. And from Malaysia, Dr. Nangao Chao Bing. Oops. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, so the recent uh, national security strategy document and a national defense strategy document of the United States government have identified China and Russia as the main concerns and uh, basically the strategic uh, adversaries in the coming years. I assume this is the position. Uh, as I understand, the, the, for a long time, the U.S. strategy is trying not to to create or uh, have a unified Eurasian bloc and try to drive a wedge between China and Russia. But now the documents seem to actually push them to work uh, together even further. So is that really, uh, I'm just uh, uh, wondering, is that really a wise move to put China and Russia and make them actually work much closer in these documents? Thank you. Yeah, uh, if that's what the documents appear to do, uh, I've, I've got to go back and read them again because our view is that with both of those nations, with great power uh, competition at levels that we had hoped would, would see, be characterized more by cooperation and collaboration, if the competition is going to grow more strident, then uh, that's what we don't want to have happen. And in terms of their relationship, I think it's, from my review, it's objective fact that Russia has more in common with Western Europe and the United States than they have in common with uh, China. I believe China has more in common with Pacific Ocean nations and the United States uh, and India than they have in common with Russia. I think there's a natural non-convergence of interest. There may be short-term convergence in the event they want to uh, contradict international tribunals or, uh, or uh, try muscling their way into certain circumstances. But my view, I would not be wasting my time going to Beijing at the end of the month if I really thought that's the only option uh, between uh, us and China. Uh, uh, what would be the point of it? I've got more important things to do. Uh, I believe that what we're going to see is at some point in both Moscow and Beijing, they're going to recognize the reality of what we see in this room. Many different nations all sitting down together, all trying to find a way forward with respect for each other's internal dynamics, each other's cultures, and not finding this is a reason why we cannot work together. Uh, we all know we can work together. Uh, we have worked closely with Russia to defeat fascism and with China to defeat fascism. We have worked closely with other nations that we had open war with, with Germany, with Japan after World War II. There is no need for this to go in the direction you're referring to of those two against the world. Uh, there are obviously a lot of nations allied with us. There's a lot of nations uh, collaborating and partnering with us. But those nations and us combined have a desire for peace and figure out how do we can find a way through these disagreements in a positive, productive relationship. It, uh, it's competitive, certainly, 
but it does not have to be combative. And, and we all have to work hard at that. But I will go back and read the documents again uh, after you go through it about 30 times be, before you sign it. Uh, you can sometimes start missing the forest for the trees. So thanks for bringing it up. I'll take a look at it. It's certainly not uh, how we see the world. In about two minutes, we will move immediately to the second plenary on the important issue of de-escalating the North Korean crisis. But I hope you will all agree with me that we, will, we have had just now a very clear statement from the U.S. Secretary of Defense and a tremendous conversation with the Secretary of Defense uh, in command of the subject matter, the issues, the strategy, and its defense uh, diplomatic uh, execution. And please join me in thanking him for these 45 minutes. <laughs>